how do I write, how do I decide to write a certain book? And this one began 10 years ago with a moment. So this is the origin story of Surprise, Kill, Vanish. I was at my house. I used to be a Homeland Security reporter before I started writing about national security. And a former source who had been a federal agent had left the Department of Homeland Security and taken a job overseas. He was very mysterious. I couldn't ask any questions. But he was coming back from the Middle East. And he stopped by the house I live in Los Angeles for a visit. With him, he brought what's called a challenge coin. On one side, it said Kabul, Afghanistan, and on the other side, it said US Department of State. Now, my source, who by then was a friend, um, didn't have anything diplomatic in his background. He was military trained. I was curious, but again, I knew not to ask any questions. I had two young boys at the time, and our garden was filled with GI Joes from the American Revolution to the present. And they have those little plastic weapons, and the boys had mixed them all up. And the source out in the garden helped them to learn what weapon went with what soldier from what period of time. And the boys were amazed. And afterwards, he said, um, I have a couple weapons I will show you if it's OK with your mom and dad. Now, I knew him to be a licensed safety instructor, so I said that would be fine. He set up on the dining room table a long rifle and there was a scope on it. We live up in a canyon in Hollywood, and way across the canyon, as I looked through the scope, I could see the veins on a leaf. And I had an idea what my source slash former source friend might be doing in Afghanistan. <laughs> Later, the boys went out to the garden, and there was one case on the ground that he never opened. I asked him what was in it, he opened it up. There was a knife, a very large knife with a serrated edge. And I said, what's that for? Immediately realizing my naivete. And he said, sometimes a job requires quiet. He left it at that. He never said another word. I knew not to ask. But I began thinking. I wanted to know why. I wanted to know what he was doing, and I also wanted to know about my own reaction to it. In other words, I could imagine someone setting up a sniper rifle and taking out a Taliban or an Al-Qaeda fighter that way, but the idea of someone slitting someone's throat or jabbing it in their ribs really gave me pause. And that curiosity led me to write Surprise, Kill, Vanish, because there is an idea that exists in the national security world that one way of conducting warfare is from a distance. That is called offset strategy. And another way of conducting war is close up. And so there began my journey into this book. Surprise, kill, vanish is actually the motto of the OSS Jedbergs. That was the precursor organization to the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services. And the idea was that uh, military operators not wearing any identifiable military clothing would jump out of airplanes, surprise, meet up with their French resistance partners in places like Nazi-occupied France, um, kill Nazis, and then vanish. And this created a big rift because one idea was that gentlemen don't slit throats. And so that is part of the reason why Truman disbanded the OSS after the, um, the war ended. But before that, I want you to keep this in mind. We trained a lot of individuals. They are called indigenous force partners. And as you can see here, there are two OSS officers there. And it, shortly before the atomic bombs were dropped, we were in Vietnam training Ho Chi Minh and who would become General Jop in 1945. And these two individuals would wind up becoming on our kill list during the Vietnam War after the OSS trained them in guerrilla warfare tactics. So much of my narrative is about how this division exists between this idea of gentlemen's warfare and war that is ungentlemanly, or guerrilla warfare, or un unconventional warfare. 
But I also want you to think about that idea of killing and how it sits with you because it's something I think about. And I'm going to jump forward to the end of my book here so that you can kind of get a sense of how I like to write history. That there on the right is Billy Waugh. He's the main character of my book. He's the longest serving CIA operator in its history that we know of. He was assigned to kill General Jop during the Vietnam War. And there I am with, well, you can't see me, but I'm behind the camera, with Billy Waugh. And that there is General Jop's son. General Jop was not killed by Billy Waugh. I narrate the story in the book. Instead, Jop lived to the ripe old age of 103. But the man um, with his finger up was Jop's commander who was in charge of killing Billy Waugh. <laughs> and we talked about what war meant. We talked about whether it was gentlemanly or whether it was brutal, and I'll get to that at the end. There's Billy Waugh as a young soldier. Um, he was trained in conventional warfare. He fought in Korea and found it boring and wanted to get into special forces and unconventional warfare, and that is what he did. The tip of the tip of the spear of unconventional warfare is assassination. People often say, well, that's ridiculous, Annie. EO12333 does not allow for assassination. But as I explained in the book, it does, because an EO is an executive order. It can be overwritten by another president's executive order, and it has throughout history. So let me pause for a moment. The idea of the CIA's paramilitary comes from the concept of tertia optio. That's Latin for the third option. So the president's first option is diplomacy. And when that, doesn't, when that fails, there is war. That's the second option. After world, the end of World War II, with the creation of the National Security Act in 1947, the president was given a secretive third option. And that is the CIA's paramilitary wing. It is designed to act like the hidden hand. All operations are meant to be what is called plausibly denied. It is why you hear mostly about the CIA's failures, because those become public. Much of their success stories remain hidden. Some of them I write about in the book. But so jumping to the tip of the tip of the spear, that the most lethal action of the president when he calls upon the CIA for the third option is assassination. And to give you an idea of the way in which it's hidden, these are all from National Security Archive documents that I located. President Eisenhower called his program health alteration. <laughs> President Kennedy called his executive action. Jumping forward to President Reagan, it was called preemptive neutralization. President Bush, during the War on Terror, called his program Lethal Direct Action, also Direct Lethal Action. And President Obama was the first president to call it what it is, which is targeted killing. One of the targeted killings that is known to most people, or many people, involves Che Guevara. And I write the backstory of it into this book for a couple reasons. There's a mythology that Che was this noble uh, freedom fighter, which in many regards he was, but he was also a big advocate of nuclear war. He spoke of it publicly. And for that reason, he wound up on the president's kill list. He was, the mission to kill Che was led by a CIA team, Felix Rodriguez, on the, on the right here was the officer in charge. I interview him and tell his story in the book. And on the left, the trigger pullers were the Bolivian Rangers. But this gives you an indication of the United States' work with what are called indigenous force partners. So going back to the OSS, surprise, kill, vanish. We worked with the French. We worked with whoever, whoever were the indigenous forces in the country who knew the lay of the land, who could take our operators around. And that was the case in Bolivia when Che was killed. I traveled with Billy Waugh because I want you to think about this idea of killing and what it means. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it necessary? And I went to Cuba with Billy Waugh to meet Che's son. And there he is, smoking a cigar. Um, 
And we had a very interesting discussion, which I report in the book, about what that means and what it means to national security and whether it is gentlemanly or ungentlemanly, whether it is savage and brutal or whether it is necessary. Kennedy plays a very interesting role in my book because the CIA's authority to conduct paramilitary operations happens under what is called Title 50. That is very different than what is called Title 10, which is how the Defense Department runs its military programs. The CIA has the authority to kill people under Title 50. The Defense Department does not, unless it's in a war theater. So for example, the story of the killing of bin Laden is always reported as having been you know, operated by Navy SEALs, which is the case in one sense. Those individuals were Navy SEAL trained operators. However, it was a CIA mission, and they were essentially you know, working for the CIA under Title 50 authority. It's why the director of the CIA, Leon Panetta, appears in that famous photograph with Obama, because the Pentagon cannot kill an individual in a sovereign foreign nation like Pakistan, so it was a CIA mission. But what Kennedy did, which was a very pivotal point in US history in this whole discussion, is the Bay of Pigs happened early in his presidency, within his first 100 days. And he was so humiliated. Again, there's an operation that was a CIA paramilitary operation, a terrible failure. Therefore, it is very well known to the public. President Kennedy was so furious with the CIA for having humiliated him, he got a private message from Che Guevara thanking him for the humiliation on the part of the United States. And Che Guevara telling Kennedy, now Cuba has gone from a, a nation no one heard about to a place everybody knows. Um, Kennedy was furious and, furious, and what I learned from the archives that I looked at is that he switched the roles in essence. So he took that paramilitary authority away from the CIA early in Vietnam, this is long before the Gulf of Tonkin, and he gave it to the Defense Department. So he turned the Defense Department operators into a paramil into running paramilitary operations, which got very ugly very quickly in the early days of, C of, of Vietnam. And we see that same element, at least my interpretation, that's how I saw it, coming to bear again in the war on terror. The precursor organization to today's Special, the CIA's Special Activities Division runs operations in the War on Terror, and its branch that does the most of the work on the ground is called Ground Branch. There's also an Air Branch, and there's a Maritime Branch. I write a lot about Ground Branch. But the precursor organization to all that was in, CIA, was in uh, Vietnam, and it was called Mac V. SOG. SOG was originally a CIA brainchild. It stood for Studies and Operations Group. It was a euphemism meant to sound like men in ivy towers and bow ties kind of observing what was happening in Vietnam. Actually, it was this lethal direct action program. And, the guy, and it was so deadly that those who knew about it called it suicide on the ground. Billy Waugh was one of its fearsome operators conducting hundreds of mis missions across enemy lines into places like Laos, a sovereign nation, not allowed, but was nonetheless done. We see that same situation happening today. And there is Billy Waugh in that bottom corner um, doing what was one of the first halo jumps into, com into a combat zone behind enemy lines into Laos and Vietnam. HALO stands for high altitude, low opening. It is an infiltration technique of paramilitary operators and military operators alike, but it all began in Vietnam. That was the first jump. And I have the shot on the top of President Johnson, you know, looking at that table, kind of looking at war like a gentleman's game. And I want you to keep in mind when you think about that, and maybe hopefully if you read my book, because I really like to raise this question, what is, what is war at its essence? 
After the Vietnam War, no one wanted anything to do with the CIA, with special forces, with the military in general. At the CIA, it was called the Time of Troubles. And these executive orders were put in place also with the church committee hearings where many people believe assassination became illegal. That is not the case. As I mentioned, it merely became an executive order that was prohibited, but that would change over time as I demonstrate. But I think this is an interesting photo because you see here Chief of Staff Donald Rumsfeld on the left with President Ford and Deputy Chief of Staff Dick Cheney briefing the president. And these documents from the National Archive make clear that this was the beginning of that restoration of power to give power back to the CIA and its paramilitary authority after the Vietnam War. It was an interesting time for most of the operators because they had nothing to do. And I interview, many of the people I interview now in their 80s were these Mac V. SOG operators who would later go on and count, you know, consult during the War on Terror. But one of them was my main character, Billy Waugh. And here's a man who never ever talks about fear. He said he's never, he told me he had never felt fear in his whole life except once. And that was after the Vietnam War when his services were no longer needed. He worked in the post office. <laughs> and he worked in the post office for five years and he told me it was terrifying. He said he was worried he would become an old man at the end of the bar talking about the war. But instead in 1977 he got a call from the CIA and he found himself back in action, in operation, and he w was sent to Libya where he, his cover was that he trained Gaddafi's generals. Um, actually, he was working for the CIA and taking covert photographs of military, Gaddafi's military bases, and these would become the first most significant insider photographs for the CIA, beginning what would be Billy Waugh's career that would go on through the war on terror. And there he is with Gaddafi's generals. After Reagan took office, the CIA really took a turn toward where it is now, which is and I should say the CIA's paramilitary wing, the Special Activities Division, began that pivot toward where it is now. And that began with his director, Bill Casey, who was an OSS officer during World War II and had devised the plot to try and assassinate Hitler, something General Eisenhower did not want done. That was not what gentlemen do. But Bill Casey, using his lawyerly legalese, found a way around that to have Eisenhower authorize uh, killing Hitler. But it was never, that, that mission was never, never put into, into play, although, Everyone was, they were training for it, and it's a super interesting story, I think, in the, in the early pages of my book. Another part I really found key to the narration of this history is how, on the opposite side of a, the coin, of this paramilitary action, of these Title 50 operations, which often result in the killing, the preemptive neutralization of high-value targets and foreign leaders, is how to protect our own president from that, from assassination. And to tell that story, I learned from Lou Merletti, who would later become the 19th director of the Secret Service, how his mind works in that concept. Merletti, like Billy Waugh, was a US Army Green Beret during the Vietnam War, and there he is as a young man. Merletti would rise up through the ranks and he, he would protect all these presidents um, winding up the, the 19th director of the Secret Service. But what is also very interesting and, and not very well known at all is that the Secret Service has a component that is a paramilitary element, which is called the CAT team, and that stands for Counter Assault Team. So everyone on the CAT team, which included Lou Merletti, he was one of the founding members, has paramilitary or military training. And they use that same mentality that the CIA operators use behind enemy lines to attack. They use that same mentality to defend 
against an attack that would occur, that, that could occur against our president. So they have a very different role than the Secret Service agents that we all know about. And I think that's a very interesting thing to keep in mind that we have this whole element of the Secret Service that remains hidden, very much like the CIA's hidden hand. I love this shot because it's of the, C the longest, one of the longest serving CIA attorneys named John Rizzo. And he was in the Middle East in 1985. And he, he gave me this photograph to use because it indicated how everyone in the CIA is always being watched, more or less, when they're in the Middle East. This photograph, Rizzo said, just was taken of him and kind of was slipped under his hotel room door as a reminder. And he's an attorney. But why I found him extraordinarily helpful to me in reporting this book was that he was able to take me through a lot of the questions I had regarding how it is that the president is able to authorize these actions. Because everything I write in my book, Surprise, Kill, Vanish, no matter how shocking it may seem, it is all legal. The 70s, I mean, the 90s, Freudian slip, the, the, the 90s was a unique time for the CIA's paramilitary, certainly for the tip of the tip of the spear, and that would be preemptive neutralization, targeted killing. Um, Bill Clinton, as far as I know, is the only president who would not authorize any of these actions, and most of them remain classified, but the operators tell me that Clinton would not. Billy Wall was in Sudan at the time, and he took the first agency photographs of bin Laden, who was kind of a nobody at the time, but there was talk of killing him. And the memo, there's two versions of this event, which I report in the book because it's so controversial because the outcome is so significant. According to Billy Waugh, he asked the station chief, a man named Kofer Black at the time, if um, once they had these reconnaissance photographs of this shadowy figure named Bin Laden, uh, if they could go ahead and kill Bin Laden. And according to Waugh, the memo was sent to President Clinton, who the message, that came back down was, no, and please don't ever ask me anything like that again. According to Kofor Black, the memo never went to Clinton, so readers are gonna have to decide about that. Um, but another person that was photographed during that time um, where Clinton was deciding to have people arrested was Carlos the Jackal, and Billy Waugh took that famous photo, or it's not so famous, that fascinating, photograph on the end, that was Carlos the Jackal. He was the most wanted terrorist in the world before bin Laden. Um, and he was arrested in Sudan, and the credit, interestingly, went to the French. But that was a CIA operation. So it's an example of the hidden hand working, something that we don't ever know about as citizens. We just, we just hear in passing and think, oh, is that interesting? And later, time reveals the CIA's hidden hand. I love this photograph. That's Billy Waugh there in the 90s, looking like someone's grandfather touring Egypt, but he's on a mission in Cairo. So as I wind up, as I come sort of to the end of my discussion before we have um, questions, I want you to think about the war on terror, because this was an extraordinarily pivotal time. After 9-11, a memorandum of notification was signed by the president on September 17th, which gave broad authorities to the CIA, to its paramilitary wing, to its special activities division, allowing for the direct lethal action against individual people. So this would become known as targeted killing through the drone strike program made public by President Obama, but it was in existence from September 17th, and it also involved ground operators. Billy Waugh is kind of like the Forrest Gump or the Zelig of the CIA's paramilitary wing. He's in every operation, and of course, there he is early in Afghanistan. He's with the beard on the far right, with a, um, what is called an ODA. So, you know, if you read any think tank documents or the Defense Department literature, 
It is reported that the war in Afghanistan began on October 6th. That's actually not true. The war began shortly after the September 17th Memorandum of Notification when the CIA Special Activities Division sent 115 of its operators into Afghanistan, one of whom was Billy Waugh, augmented with 2,000 special operation force partners, guys from the Defense Department, SEALs, Delta, PJs, MARSOC, and together they went after individual targets before the bombing campaign began on October 6th. Another component that I write about in the book that became an integral part of this lethal direct action campaign would be um, targeting. And I tell that story through Ken Stiles, who's there in the center. Before 9-11, he was what was called an overt CIA operator, or not operator, analyst. So he could actually tell people that he worked for the CIA. He was kind of like a nerd at a desk. And after 9-11 happened, because of his skills with um, maps and geolocating, he was called upon to build the system which would later be used for targeting, it was so popular and such an important part of this targeting rubric that the White House called it the magic box. And when there were problems in Afghanistan with the technology, Ken Stiles, this nerd at a desk, was sent to Afghanistan, and there he is all weaponed up with his indigenous force partners um, taking care of the technology in the war theater. The same thing was going on in northern Iraq. The CIA's paramilitary wing was there operating before the shock and awe campaign began, trying to take out targets, uh, Saddam Hussein's Mukbarat. I tell that story through Sam Faddis, the CIA paramilitary officer who ran that program. And I want you to think about this as we come to the end because, you know, much of, you have gentlemanly warfare, which is this idea that war should be fought by gentleman rules, and then you have down and dirty guerrilla warfare, unconventional warfare. And then there's another really dark component of all that, which is revenge-based assassination. And that is what happens most everywhere else in the world from my analysis of it all. And it's what our CIA operators got sucked into in Iraq, where revenge-based justice began to rule the roost. This is a ground branch team in Iraq. And uh, as far as I know, all but two of these individuals that were on this team are now buried in Arlington. President Obama decided to revoke enhanced interrogation, also called torture, and he accelerated targeted killing. So in that way, his assassination program became bigger than any of the other presidents combined as far as, uh, as I understand. He also expanded the Special Activities Division, the paramilitary wing of the CIA, into what is now the Special Activities Center. So it is its own disciplinary center with operators working in 134 countries around the globe. This is what a ground branch team looks like in Afghanistan. And if you look, you know, some of these guys are in like polo shirts. So this idea to remain hidden is a major component of all of this, as is the idea that what we know about all of this is very limited. The indigenous force partners have been very difficult for the operators to work with, at least the ones that I interviewed for the book. A lot of things um, make their partnership very different from that French partnership back in the days of the OSS. And a lot of that has to do with a very high illiteracy rate in Afghanistan, and also what operators tell me is very poor training. There's also a major, major problem with drugs, and for this, the Defense Department looks the other way. This is a photograph that was released in error by the Defense Department, but I leave it here because I want you to think about this. That's a ground branch operator on the right, 
and with him is his indigenous force partner. This is called the Afghan face because the idea is that uh, it is meant to look as if the Americans, as if the CIA, as if the Pentagon is not over there conducting these operations on their own accord, but rather at the behest of the Afghans or whatever the indigenous force partnership is. But if you look closely at that photograph, and it's hard to hear, you can see the man looks very stoned. Um, most of the operators complain about the extreme drug use over there. And also anyone who is weapons trained here can realize that he's not holding his gun properly. It's as if it's a prop. So on that note, I bring you back to the final thought of this, which is, you know, gentlemen's warfare, guerrilla warfare, what is right, what is wrong, what is necessary. It was remarkable to be in Vietnam with Billy Waugh and the son of the man he was supposed to kill and didn't, um, General Zhang, who was in charge of killing the Americans and killed many of them, and seeing these old two enemies talking about what this meant. Um, the Vietnamese were, had, you know, fought the war they needed to fight. The Americans fought the war they needed to fight, but was any of it necessary? This here is a parting shot of Lou Merletti, director of the Secret Service, and Billy Waugh, longtime CIA operator. They believe that it is necessary, that offense and defense are two sides of the national security coin. With that, I will open up the room for questions, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Yeah. Hi. I'm looking forward to reading your book. It'll be interesting to see how the things evolve over the different presidencies. So, it'll, okay. So what do you think about the current administration and what's going on? Do you follow mm -hmm. the current mm -hmm. things? So I think the most important thing to recognize is that the everything that I've been talking about as a history has been building, and it is building. One of the reasons I left the Trump administration's work in this world out of the book was so as not to create a polemic because I think that the situation that we're in right now as a country is so divided that I didn't want to uh, add to that sort of vitriol. Um, and one of the things that I believe I showed very clearly, with, with the exception of President Clinton, all of the presidents, Democratic and Republic, Republican alike, and I, and I interviewed men who served under 13 presidents, starting with FDR. Um, all of the presidents use this tool, and so one can only conclude that it is presently being used. And my read on the situation is that the president's behest is a give and take with it, the CIA directors, and not as much presidentially driven as it is a give and take. And I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, when I think of covert operations and the CIA in particular, I think of being undercover. These guys were rather conspicuous in their surroundings at best. Their cover was that they were there at the behest of the indigenous uh, partners. Um, how that? How did that work out, both from an intelligence and their own security? Well, you're absolutely right. So the one, the, the places where they, where they are looking like a military unit in Vietnam, and that ground branch team in Iraq that I showed you, where they're in camouflage, no one has any markings on them. So nothing can identify them as uh, part of the U.S. military. That was also true of the SEALs during the raid on bin Laden. Um, even the, the tags on the clothing is not US made. The cigarettes they smoke are not from the United States. So if they're captured, there is that deniability. Um, those are in the war theater or jumping across enemy lines, usually from bases that exist in the war theater. 
but there are also units that work in street clothes, as I showed that other photograph. And that is also the way, for example, someone like Billy Wall always operated. He's what's called a singleton, so he would work as a one-man show. And I have a photograph of him elsewhere um, when he was in Sudan taking photographs of bin Laden, for example, his cover was that he was an old man on a fitness craze. And there's a photograph of him in kind of like a track suit, a sweatsuit and a sweatband, and he's out running around. And he told me this story where he would run by bin Laden's place. Bin Laden had these big Afghan dogs who would try and attack him, so he had a pipe and he would hit them. And the bodyguards would follow him, and after he was such a good jogger, after a while they would just say, he must really be an old man on a fitness craze. It's too weird to be doing that in Sudan. Thank you for exploring <clears throat> issues of good and evil in the world. Um, in your research of this book, uh, did you get any sense about other countries, other countries' operations, and also what might call the effectiveness of it? That is, for it, it's often, in, in, in general, <clears throat> I find that people talk about sort of intelligence, particularly human intelligence, as being some countries do it very well and others do it very mm -hmm. poorly. Mm -hmm. um, is there some comparative stuff here across nations? It's a great question, and I did a lot of research in that department and found out that I would have had a thousand page long book if I had reported all that. But I do tell the story of one key Russian assassin who was the first assassin to defect to the United States in the 50s, he gave the CIA an extraordinary amount of information about how the KGB worked and essentially still works. Uh, the Russians are notorious poisoners, and that's something we see today, and that also goes back in time to the 50s. Interestingly, the Russians poisoned that defector, his name was Nikolai Kolkov, who came over in the 50s uh, with the same radioactive poison that they killed um, Litvinenko with recently. So you can see some things never change. Uh, I had a question about, in your work with covert operations in other countries, did you come across or get a sense of what kind of covert operations are happening internally in our country with the CIA and homegrown terrorism or in the supremacy movement or other areas? Thank you. I mean, that's a great question, and that is, at least to this reporter, an impenetrable area. Um, it involves from what I understand, a partnership with the FBI. But what I do know is that the CIA's largest base is presently in New York City. So. Uh, you interviewed Jack Singlob for this mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what kind of, what was he like? What kind of person mm -hmm. was, is he? And uh, di also, did he happen to mention his activities after he was fired by Carter? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know Jack Singlob, General Singlob, um, and when I interviewed him, I was, he was 97. So it, the information is limited. Um, I reported his story through a lot of doc documents and then had an opportunity to sit with him and talk about that on a personal level. But he was an original OSS officer, so he jumped out of those planes and went after Nazis during World War II. And then he had a, a very... Um, significant career running CIA operations in Korea. Some of the earliest, least well-known CIA operations called Jack. Um, I write about those in the book. He was fascinating to learn. And then he, uh, he ran Mac V. SOG operations in Vietnam. He had a very controversial um, later in life career after Carter fired him, and I get into that in a little bit in the book. But with all of these individuals, it's a very interesting balance, at least for me as a reporter, to try and move beyond the, the heroics, the, the valor, all of which is very important. I also like to work with my sources, both sides of the argument, to ask them the deeper, more philosophical questions that I raised tonight because I think those are uh, important to all of us as, you know, citizenry. And for, and for that, I'll, I'll remind everyone that, 
you know, Eisenhower um, talked about the military industrial complex in his farewell speech. It was the one big thing he chose to talk about, one big thing he chose to talk about when he left office in 1961, and it's a very real threat. But he also talked about the antidote to that, and that is called an alert and knowledgeable citizenry, which is why I love seeing everybody sitting here tonight, which is why I write my books. Um, and it is what, what I always ask of my sources to share their true feelings about all this with me because I think that's where we can become the most alert and the most knowledgeable. Yes. Thank you for being here tonight. I was wondering if you are covering the role of women in the CIA at all and telling any of their stories, particularly mm -hmm. since uh, the recent publication, The Name Escapes Me, the woman with the wooden leg, who Virginia was so Hall. instrumental yeah. during World War II. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, um, it's a great question. I mean, women are few and far between in the world of paramilitary operators. Obviously, they were not working um, in, in Vietnam, but they have been working in the War on Terror. And in the very last pages of my book, I write about a until now um, secret uh, team, it was called the Stalker Team. Um, it has never been reported before, but one of the members of the team uh, gave me some of the information that I was able to report about how it was a 12-person team that went after uh, high-value targets immediately after 9-11 in NATO partner countries, so it was very controversial. One of the members of the stalker team was a woman, and they called her the femme fatale, and she was able to get herself into situations that um, men can't. <laughs> this side. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm curious if there, are, what are the limits on the actions of these people, moral or something. I mean, you talk about a sort of gentleman war and then yeah. non-gentlemanly war. Um, the whole concept of war seems to be the, sort of a, a breakdown of the normal mm -hmm. legal structures that limit what people can do. And we do have the Geneva Conventions as an attempt of an international mm -hmm. organization that tries to put some limits on warfare. Do the Geneva Conventions apply at all to these paramilitary mm -hmm. activities to the CIA? Has there ever been any case of, of someone prosecuted for violating mm -hmm. Geneva Conventions? I mean, uh, what, what limits, is there anything that limits mm -hmm. what the CIA mm -hmm. does, or at least, I mean, other than the president mm -hmm. um, limiting them, but I mean, if the president's aggressive, <laughs> um, is there anything that limits what the president can call for? So I get into the fine points of that question, which was certainly a question I had as well, and write about how the, the Title 50 entwines with these ideas of the, what even predates the Geneva Convention, what are called the Lieber Codes from the Civil War. Um, and the documentation, the executive orders are written and structured with all of that in mind so that everything that is done at the president's behest is legal and does not violate whether it's does not violate any of the codes whether it's legalese or whatever however you want to consider it but most of it really boils down to in simple terms is the right to self defense and that is why a term like preemptive neutralization is is such a key component of all of this because it's saying we're going to take you out before you take us out to the individual. Yeah. Hi. Um, you talked about an escalation in these covert operations worldwide. Do you see a path to de-escalate or diminish this? I mean, I do not have a crystal ball on that one. But what I do know, you know, I mean, a lot of times people ask me what my opinion is to that, of is this a good thing, a bad thing, because obviously it is escalating. And in, on balance, what I will say is when I interview young men who have come, and I have interviewed a lot of them, who have come home from war, having gone into the war theater as military soldiers for the Pentagon under Title X authority, and they come home missing limbs, terrible PTSD, um, and I 
spend time with them, and then I spend time with a CIA paramilitary operator who's closer to my age, and you know, ha spent decades training in the military to become a SEAL, to become a Delta operator, a tier one operator, then joins the CIA paramilitary, essentially saying, send me, let me do this job, I want to do this job, I am good at this job. And so I weigh that out, and that makes me, that, that raises the most questions inside of me about, which leads to, you know, back to your question about is, is this getting bigger? And my answer to that is, you know, one must, one might want to think about that second option, going to war, sending the young boys to war versus a paramilitary operation by the CIA with operators who want to go. That's what the president, any president, is really dealing with and considering. And, you know, we could have a whole other discussion about blowback about that. But I think that that is the reason why we see the third option being used more often than the second option in what we now can call, because of the military-industrial complex, the forever war. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to reading your book. Uh, one book I read just recently was The Devil's Chessboard. Um, about the Dulles brothers before Vietnam was so much part of the story, but, um, and I don't know, well, my trust as a, an alert, informed citizen mm -hmm. is very low because they're not always military operations. They're to mess with democratically elected leaders who are in their way financially, whatever, economically. And so, um, and unfortunately, I've read way too many books, put stuff together. It's like, I, I don't, I, I believe they use this as a cover too for economic interests. And so. Um, Did you maybe I, have a question that I could answer? Yeah. <laughs> no, I well, mean, I, I, it's, uh, yeah. I, it's well, all well taken. Okay, but. well, you're brave to write this book, I think. and. Uh, I guess, yeah, did you do any research mm -hmm. earlier with JFK fired Alan Dulles? Yes. Who then carried out his own operations mm -hmm. in France with Nazis. And so when I tell people about it, they think that, that can happen. So I think so. maybe your question is, is how did I deal with this idea of is the CIA taking advantage of its covertness and well, perhaps... Yeah. So and I'll the answer actions of the men who yeah. say we need this. I'll, I'll answer it. I'll answer it this way. Okay. I started out writing the book to to ask exactly that question, and without being vague or obtuse, I mean, I did write a 500-page book for for a reason because these are complex, complicated ideas, and I don't think they can be summed up by me or anyone else. You know properly to say, yes, you know, it's black, it's white. It's, it's very complex, and the situation is like a serpent. It's winding around itself, and in some cases, it's leading to, you know, complicated blowback. And in other situations, you might dare say it's a job well done. Kennedy had the reputation of hiring these whiz kids. Uh, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say Trump, maybe not so much. Um, how much should we worry about the dumbing down going to this level? The dumbing down. I mean, I, it's, you know, it, it does all come back to the people. Who are the people? Um, making the decisions and i think that what i do know what i do know for sh certain is that the idea of paramilitary at the cia i should say at least for certain from the people i interviewed um, is becoming more popular one operator said to me and i write this in the book and this was what's called a cis Two, so that's a senior intelligence service individual who is the level of a general at the Pentagon. And he said, you know, Annie, um, 
the CIA used to look down on knuckle draggers. That's what the guys call themselves, and not anymore. So there is an idea that the CIA's military wing is perhaps better equipped to take the third option for the president as opposed to the second op option over at the Pentagon, which winds up with a giant footprint. To that end, I'm going to give you one fact. Um, almost completely unknown because it was reported by the Inspector General of Afghanistan whose position has just been removed. So this is one of the last statistics you're going to get. But the, um, the last month of 2018, the Pentagon dropped 7,000, I'm sorry, the last year in 2018, the Pentagon dropped 7,200 bombs on Afghanistan. That is a lot more activity than a few guys with a serrated knife. Thank you for being here and sharing very interesting and educational. Uh, Three-part question, I'll fire them off. Number one, what is the, um, the incentive for the folks to share their stories with you um, in very limited conversation with service members in the past? Some of them like to think of themselves as quiet professionals. You know, we do mm -hmm. our business, we don't talk about it. Um, and uh, and then is there any, you know, with a book like this that's, granted we're a little bit in the past, but in terms of secrets, things like that, is there any review that has to go through any bodies mm -hmm. of government to say, hey, you can talk about this, you can't talk about that? So as a journalist, I'm not... I'm not held to what's called the PR, you know, the, the CIA's board of review. Um, as far as uh, people talking to me, I generally work with sources who are much older. So that in all five of my books that I've written, the emphasis is on history. And so in that regard, many of the programs are declassified. The public might not even know about that, but because they kind of get declassified and buried. And so sources are very clear about what they can talk about and what they can't. So there's no OPSEC, which is operational security shared. And then the way I think in which I get sources to talk to me has to do with that Eisenhower principle, which is it's important for the citizenry to know enough to be able to make an informed decision, particularly about the, the CIA, I think, because otherwise we're stuck with this idea that all they do are the Bay of Pigs and, and Guatemala. Um, and we, it's, it's valid to know a bit about how the national security apparatus works so that you can have a, a say in it. You know, to that end, I'll say Congress has never passed a law against assassination. So anyone who disagrees with it hands down should be talking to their congressperson. Excellent. Well, on that note, I think we'll call it for questions. We'll give a big thank you to Annie and then, yeah. <laughs> Dirty water in the falling rain You wipe your initials in the window pane Freedom walks on the avenue You'd be there too if it was up to you You never give up You never give up From the tower block to the battleground Jump on over, it's a long way down Gravity pulls to the last frontier There are no other limits here You never give up You never give up You never give up And though they may slam the door Wipe your face on the floor You've seen it before And you never give up
They scared you silly with a faceless god They wrapped your knuckles with a lightning rod You carried it with you in a gunny sack An invisible monkey on your bended back But you never gave up You never gave up You beat your head on a solid wall All you need is a crack, you don't need it all The wall just laughs and turns away You keep at it anyway You never give up, you never give up, you never give up Through every crooked deal, their laws are made of steel But they're never half as real as you are when you never give up There's a world inside where your mind is free And there's a world outside where you'd like to be And there's a fine line where your vision clears And all the distance disappears And you never give up You never give up I'll meet you when the morning comes Saxophones and the marching drums Gleetal trees by the water's edge The flowers on the window ledge They never give up You never give up You never give up Thank you very much.